Welcome to our church's celebration of Reformation Sunday. I'm Pastor Neil. Most people know that the Protestant Reformation was started by a number of Bible scholars who thought that God's purposes for the church and for the world were not adequately expressed in the countries where they lived at the time. But most people do not know that this desire to reform both church and country began several centuries before the Protestant Reformation. You can see it in the work of Jesus, and you can see it in the work of many whom God sent to serve the people for centuries before Jesus Christ was born. One of those people was a teaching priest by the name of Azariah, whose work will be described in the Bible text we read today. But before we hear his story and the story of the king he served, I invite you to think about those who have helped you to reform your faith in some way while revealing God's grace and strength to you. Marty Trekman, and it is my privilege to lead you in worship this morning. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 145, which says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. another. They, they tell, tell of your mighty, mighty acts. acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And, and I, I will meditate, meditate on, on, your on your wonderful, wonderful works. works.
Good morning, boys and girls. It feels great to spend time with you today. I've got a question for you this morning. What does it mean to be half-hearted? You can't take it literally. It doesn't mean you cut your heart in two. But if you think of the heart as the place where all your emotions lie, joy, passion, anger, tears, to be half-hearted means to be apathetic. You don't have a lot of joy. You, you just really don't care too much. So when your mom says, pick up the floor, a half-hearted person throws their clothes beneath the bed. When mom says, sweep the floor, a half-hearted person sweeps dirt beneath the rug so they don't have to pick it up. And when a teacher says, do these 10 problems for homework, a half-hearted person just writes down an answer here or there without really thinking through it and doing much work at all. Just between you and me, have you ever been half-hearted? I won't tell. Most people have especially when someone else is telling you to do things that you really don't want to do. But every now and then, a child says, I'm going to do this job well, not because I love the job, but because I love the person who asked me to do the job. And I know it's really important in the end. Today's Bible story is about a king who decided to be wholehearted in his obedience to God he chose to follow God's teaching. He chose to follow God's rules. He chose to follow God's ways. And he did all that with enthusiasm. His enthusiasm was contagious. And pretty soon, all the people that he served became wholehearted in their love of God. Great things came of that. They really did. So, the next time you are tempted to do something half hearted. Remember that your actions make a difference. They will be noticed in the end. Also remember this Bible verse, which inspires those of us who make this webcast every week. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart, as if working for the Lord, not men. That verse also says the Lord will reward you in the end. Isn't that cool? With that thought, let us pray. Dear God, help us to remember that our work matters. Every dish we wash, every task we do, does make a difference in the end, not just to those around us, but to you. So help us do our tasks well, for we ask it. In our Savior's holy name, amen. Thanks, boys and girls. I'll see you next week. Children aren't the only ones who may be tempted now and then to serve both God and others with a spirit of indifference, not fully focused on the work that we must do or the people who might be blessed by it. Thus, it is appropriate in this and every service of worship to go to God in prayer, confessing our failures, seeking his guidance, trusting his grace. If that sort of prayer is comfortable to you, then I invite you to join me in it now. Gracious and holy God, when we think about our response to your amazing grace, we realize how very often we fall short. We do not often love you with our whole heart, and we do not often love our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, God, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Through the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are made new, 
and offered the chance to begin again. Believe the good news. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. the highest king would welcome me I was lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh is free He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is free. Thank you, Brad. That was lovely. Now is the time in our church service when we share news of our church family. And we've got some good news to share. First, I'm very happy to report that several of our church members joined the fight against breast cancer last Sunday by participating in the Susan G. Komen Walk for the Cure. We walked around Meadowview subdivision. We had some great fun together. We took some good photos, too. And you'll get a chance to see those photos at the end of this broadcast. Second, several members of the church will be worshiping with a bagpiper this very morning on the church grounds that have been so lovingly restored by Rich Wyatt and Harry Clyde. It's looking so great out there. If you live in Temecula Valley, I hope you will drive by and take a look. It's a joy to worship amidst the trees and shrubs out there. Third, 
we're hosting a baby shower on the grounds at 10 a.m. next Sunday to support our Christian ed director, Ashley, and her lovely newborn child. The baby's name is Carlisle, and we are going to love her well. Fourth, we are planning to worship God inside the church building on November 1st if Riverside County stays in the red zone. That means that lots of folks have been tested and the COVID infection rate is less than 8%. Right now, we're on the edge. So if you would like to worship inside the building anytime soon, I encourage you to get tested at the Grace Melman Library right off of Inez Road. This won't just help us. It will help several small businesses in our area to stay open. It only takes five minutes. You rarely have to wait. And I'll say a little more about that next week. Finally, if you're looking for a safe way to celebrate Halloween with your kids or grandkids, you're invited to a screening of Hotel Transylvania on our church grounds Friday, October 30th. More details on that celebration can be found on our website. In addition to these celebrations, I hope you will join our church in prayer for the families who have been displaced by wildfires in the west or hurricanes in the east. May they find relief. We hope you'll pray for voters who must dig through lots of confusion claims, especially about the initiatives in our state. May they choose well. We hope you pray for Ted Goodrich as he recuperates from skin cancer and Jadira Kailama as she recuperates from cataract surgery. And with those thoughts in mind, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, thank you for the chance we have to celebrate your many blessings to us. And thank you for the chances we have to bless others with our words and deeds. Today, we intercede for the victims of natural disasters, both in our country and throughout the world. We intercede for those who are fighting breast cancer and other life-threatening diseases. We intercede for the voters who will be choosing new leaders soon. And we intercede for the leaders in our church and the owners of small businesses who are learning how to serve us in a time of constant change. We remember both Ted and Jadira as they recuperate from surgery. We remember all the young families who are learning how to learn in very close quarters. And we pray that you encourage them. Finally, God, we pray that you'll lead us in fresh new ways to serve for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. That is such an inspiring prayer. Today's Bible reading is built around two inspiring characters that almost no one knows. One is a king named Asa. The other is a teaching priest named Azariah. Even my wife didn't know those names, and she's been leading Bible studies 25 years. But we really should know those names because the Hebrew Bible tells us that Asa was one of the best kings to ever rule in ancient Israel, and the work of Azariah made him even better yet. To understand their story, you need to know a couple of things. First, the nation of Israel was divided when these characters lived. Asa ruled in the southern kingdom, a land called Judah. The tribe of Benjamin stuck with them. But 10 of the 12 tribes went to the northern kingdom, and there were lots of troubles there, plots and wars and coups. The southern kingdom had its problems too. But when this morning's text begins, they were on a roll. They had just celebrated a big victory in war, and they were feeling good. But a man named Azariah, understood far better than most that continued success in warfare or in life would demand a real commitment to the Lord on their part. Thus, Azariah made a commitment to visit with the king. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, son of Obed. He went before Asa and said, Hear me, Asa along with all of Benjamin and Judah. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. The key word here is if. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. This is called conditional theology and it plays a central role in our Old Testament. When they sought the Lord, good things occurred. But when they didn't, there was a heavy price to pay. Azariah describes that price in the next paragraph you will hear. For many days, Israel was without the faith of God, without a teaching priest and without the rules of God. In that time, there was no peace for the one who went out or the one who came in, for widespread panic afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. Nation was smashed against nation and city against city because God harassed them with all sorts of distress. In their distress, they turned to Yahweh, the God of Israel. They sought him and he was found by them. So as for you, be strong. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. The word that jumped out to me in this passage is smashed. Kahath in Hebrew means battered, broken, crushed. Sort of like a child playing with war toys, just crashing them together. In this case, it describes the conflicts between northern and southern Israel during the reign of Asa's dad and granddad. But Azariah claims that it's actually God doing it. Not those nasty northern kings, but God. Because God's people had ignored God's rules. Rules that came from Moses. Rules that needed to be enforced. Not only that, They turned to foreign gods and chose to worship them while the worship of their God, the God of Israel, was ignored. When Asa heard these words, he took courage. He took away the detestable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities that he captured in the hills of Ephraim. He also repaired the sacrificial altar 
that stood before the front porch of Yahweh's temple. Then he gathered all from Judah and Benjamin, along with resident aliens from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, who had deserted Israel when they saw that the Lord was with Asa in Judah. They gathered in Jerusalem during the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. Three crucial changes happen in this text, changes that would have been incredibly encouraging to believers in Yahweh. First, foreign idols are removed, so the people who lived in Benjamin and Judah would not be tempted to participate in foreign cults who worshiped rain or sex or childbirth. Second, the altar of Yahweh was restored. We don't know how long it had been broken or defaced, but we do know that the restoration would enable them to worship as the law of Moses had prescribed, bringing their own offerings to this temple and not some other place. Third, refugees were included in this holy work. Refugees who had fled from their adversaries, they too were invited to love and worship God. And from everything we can tell, they went all out. On that day, they sacrificed to Yahweh 700 cattle and 7,000 sheep from the war booty they had won from Cush. Then they entered into a covenant to seek Yahweh, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. They also swore that whoever did not seek Yahweh, the God of Israel, would be killed, young or old, man or woman, they swore to Yahweh with a loud voice, with shouting and cheering and trumpets and horns. Two features are crucial in this paragraph. The first one is the oath, Shabua in Hebrew. It means literally to bind oneself. In this case, to bind oneself to Yahweh, the God of Israel, with all their hearts and souls. No half-hearted measures and no exceptions either. In that sense, it's sort of like a feudal oath where the Lord of a region commits all the people in his power to the service of his king. The big difference in this case is that the commitment is not to King Asa. It's to God, the God of Israel. Every single one of them was sworn to honor him. The second feature is the sense of celebration shouting, cheering, trumpets, horns. The celebration tells us that they, this was actually a joyful oath, sort of like a wedding vow. Thus, when that vow was made, they threw a party. 700 cattle, 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of war booty. And the trumpet mentioned here was exciting too. Probably some sort of metal instrument. We don't know if it had vows, but we know that it could make a lot of noise. In a similar fashion, the horn described in this text is a shofar, which is still used in Jewish ritual. It was and is made from the horn of a great big ram. And if you've ever tried to blow one, you know it takes a lot of wind to make that sound. It's been played for three millennia, at least. And just in case that sound was not enough, there were lots of human voices, too, shouting, cheering, yelling, having fun, sort of like a victory party for the Lakers. When this pandemic's over, and all of us can remove face masks, I suspect that a lot of folks will want to act like that. All of Judah rejoiced over the oath, for they had sworn with all their hearts, they sought God with their whole desire. He was found by them, and Yahweh gave them rest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The key word in this text is rest, Noah in Hebrew. God chose to give them rest from their enemies. That means they were not at war for decades. It also means that they were not at war with themselves. 
constant turmoil, constant struggle, constant stress, having sworn to follow God with their whole hearts, they could sleep well at night, and they could observe a rest-filled Sabbath, too. According to this Bible text, two people were responsible for that rest. One was King Asa. The other was his teaching priest. And I'll talk about each of them in order. Asa clearly had the power in this text, power to wage warfare, power to knock down idols, and power to restore temples too. But the key to his success was not just power, it was commitment. Commitment to the living God. He led by example, and that example was inspiring. Since he was wholehearted in his love for God, The people were as well, and God rewarded them for that. Asa ruled 41 years, longer even than King David or King Solomon. And in those 41 years, he saw no less than seven kings rise and fall in northern Israel. Some didn't even last a year. In their struggle with idolatry and greed, there was constant turmoil But in the southern kingdom, there was harmony and peace. Asa played a big role in that. The other major player in this morning's text was Azariah, a teaching priest. He didn't just officiate at the altar. He explained why people went to the altar. He also taught the moral law, laws that must be kept outside the temple Rules like the Ten Commandments that we still keep today. And he taught them history. This is how God blessed us when we followed him. And this is how God hurt us when we turned away. That theology was not sophisticated by the standards of today, but it was effective by the standards of his day. It taught his people both to love and fear the Lord But what does that mean for us, for you and I today? Three things I think are clear. First, this text invites us to celebrate leaders, terrific leaders, who draw our hearts to God, even in the midst of certain dangers and real threats. They lead by example more than anything. King Asa was one of those leaders. George Washington was another. Abraham Lincoln was a third Lincoln spoke very few words by and large. His Gettysburg Address is just one page. But the faith that he revealed in those few words was inspiring and compelling to us all. Not every leader can be a Washington or a Lincoln or an Asa, but we need to celebrate the ones who are. We also need to celebrate teachers, terrific teachers, The role filled by Azariah in this text. More than anything else, John Calvin, the founder of the Presbyterian Church, was a terrific teacher, the first man in human history to write thick commentaries on almost every passage of God's Word. Karl Barth was a terrific teacher for our modern times, and Walter Brueggemann, who taught me, was a third. Brueggemann helped me to have sympathy for every Bible character, even those who had done wrong. And he helped me understand that no human except Jesus was completely good or bad. But the greatest Bible teacher is our Savior, Jesus Christ, who helped us separate the central features of God's law from the peripheral elements. And who summed up all the moral teaching of Scripture with just Two rules. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then love your neighbor as yourself. Inspired by those words, we need to celebrate great teachers. We need to celebrate great leaders, too. And third, we need to celebrate opportunities that we have to make commitments to our God. 
This morning's Bible text is built around one of those key commitments. Our text says that every resident of Judah and every refugee made a clear commitment to seek God with all their heart and soul and mind. Then they brought animals to sacrifice and threw a big party too. There's nothing quite like the joy of commitment. That's why weddings are so joyful, and ordinations too. I'll never forget the joy I felt kneeling there on the chancel when all those hands are placed on my head. The sense of connection with God and others is just amazing. It's so strong. Believe it or not, one may also find great joy in keeping financial commitments. I can't tell you how many people have shared that feeling with me through the years, They took a big step of faith when pledging to the church. They didn't know if they could keep it, but they did. Somehow, someway, they did. And that felt awesome. They were absolutely thrilled. That's why the elders of our church decided to send out pledge cards, even in the midst of a pandemic. Yes, of course, they help our church with budgeting, that's not the real reason that we send them. The real reason that we send them is to give our people joy. And if you haven't got one, let, just let, let us know. We'll send it out. Because there's nothing like commitment. Commitment to family. Commitment to church. Commitment to our Savior and His Word. This card is just one sign of that commitment. And when you use it to take big steps of faith, it really is a source of joy. With that thought in mind, let us pray. Thank you, God, for the opportunities that we have to celebrate great teachers we have heard, great leaders we have known, and great opportunities that we have to respond to your amazing grace with joy. Help us, God, to do this well. For we do ask it in our Savior's holy name. Amen. Please join me now in the closing hymn. Now may the God of peace, who stirred teachers and prophets and heroes and kings to pave the way for Christ, make you complete in everything good, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.